thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honoured uh, to be invited as one of the speaker uh, in, uh, with PSI. Um, I, will, I shall not waste uh, any more time. Uh, the title or the topic of today's talk will be on religion and politics, the leadership for a multi-ethnic uh, society. Uh, so I hope that you will be interested to hear what I have to say. Um, I will begin by saying that uh, there are so many obvious things I could say to open this discussion. But I'm not going to do that. We all know in Malaysia what is going on with respect to race and religion, dominance of one group over any other. No matter how one would like to spin around it, we cannot run away from this obvious fact. It is there to see Malay supremacy and a certain kind of Islamic dominance over all our daily lives. And that is prevalent in every corner of Malaysia. Even in Sabah and Sarawak, albeit the version is subtler. This singular supremacy ideology that has governed us from the days of Malaya to the Federation of Malaysia is the root cause of the terrible state that we are in today. But it did not emerge from one community. We are all responsible let me explain. Before we understand what needs to happen, we need to understand why this happened. The vaccine researchers needed to understand the root cause of the virus behavior, drill down to its genetic material before they can come up with a solution that can only work by creating another set of genetic form to overcome the virus. The single most important document that frames our nation is the federal constitution. From day one, it has singled out one race and one religion. Were the Malays in need of protection? Was Islam in need of protection? No one really cared about our indigenous peoples. Actually, they are only there in name. So look at our history prior to the formation of Malaysia. There has, there has been anything close to May 13 racial riots between the races in our history before Malaysia in spite of colonization? None. Not before the Japanese occupation, not during the return of British colonizers. Even the Communist Party of Malaya has a big branch of Malay communists with equally well-known leaders beside Chingpeng, Rashid Maidin, Shamsia Fake to just name two of the most well-known. The narrative we have been taught in school is that the British divided and ruled the races. Is that really true? Or is that, mere, is that a mere accident of natural order of competencies of the societies in our population? And is that the narrative our intellectual academia who are naturally anti-colonial and our political elite would rather promote. Do the British really needed to divide the races in order to rule? Or do they just needed to bribe the feudal lords with power and satisfy their greed to lord over their own people? Think about it. But here are the facts of our own societies going back in time before us being a nation. I am not that familiar with Sabah and Sarawak societal dynamics, but let's just say for those who are, can you see tribal identities overriding humanity in your societies? In Malaya, we have the Malays who are lorded over by their feudal system. In fact, slavery is common in feudal Malay societies. Is feudalism Islamic? You may want to ask. The answer is no. The Prophet Muhammad was never a nobility, nor did he leave a legacy for feudalism to be the system of governance. So which Islam is being protected? The Indians brought, them, brought with them their caste system within their own society. And before anyone tries to justify the origins of such system, I always say this, just as I criticize the dogma of my own so-called ulama justifying their rules, I will do the same of others. 
The caste system is the divide and rule by, by our own political elites to maintain their positions. We are even racist with our own kind. Then let's look at the Chinese societies with their clannish mentality. Why does this happen? Again, there will be those who will come and justify to me the tribalism mentality inherent in this society. When I see clan associations, it is a mere system for champion leaders of those clans to be the power brokers in their society. My conclusion is simple. Our society pre-independence was dominated by racial thinking and led by leaders of racial mindset that must hold on to their positions to champion their set of race and tribes in order to be at the seat of power. And hence, the negotiations for nationhood become one of power broking instead of one of nation building. Our intellectuals in academia seem blind to this. Why? Because those who first wrote this history for us were wrapped in anti-colonial hatred that they failed to see our own inner demons. And that narrative was handed to subsequent generation, generations of scholars and that is what we are taught. That is the leadership we got for Malaysia. I may be called blasphemous to their memories of fighting for our independence, but I don't care. I call a spade a spade, the way I see it. What we had was not leadership for our multi-ethnic society. What we got was a brokerage to remain the top of their societies for the feudal strata and the political elite of the races. And we, are, we end up with a constitution, a DNA that was written religion and race being the basis of where we start this nation. And the path that leads it is what we see today. That is a long preamble to my lecture, uh, but here is the second part where do we go from here? The nation desperately needs a change in the people that represents us in parliament. Don't even talk of prime ministerships when we are not even thinking that parliament cannot be made to change. Because nothing changes without parliament in our system. Nothing. We are not a presidential republic where we can vote our chief executive into power to provide that leadership. Therefore, we must find a way where this first-past-the-post parliamentary system work to our benefit. We must think outside the box. I want to take two nations that has been very successful through two different ways in re relatively short time frame and see how we can forge our own way by learning from their success. <clears throat> the United States was a coalition of independent Independent colonies that, ca that came together against taxation without representation. A nice word for overthrowing the British monarchy, the New World, attributed to authors Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston on July 4th, 7th. These founding fathers of the United States were all highly regarded and well established lawyers before being politicians, except for Franklin and third presidents. While Sherman went to the Senate and Livingston went on to judicial high office in New York, Ben Franklin, on the other hand, is probably the most accomplished man amongst all four. A polymath, a physicist, an inventor, and later a diplomat. Notice something. Not a single preacher in their lot. Their first president, George Washington, was a reluctant, gen reluctant general and politician. He was a wealthy plantation owner in Virginia who was a surveyor and a military man. He was the commander of the Virginia reg uh, Regiment. The second sentence of the declaration says it all for us. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then the Constitution in its preamble states, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensuring domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, 
promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. So in spite of ongoing slavery in the mostly South, a strongly religious population, the framers of the independence and constitution knows from day one what to avoid and what to promote why so different compared to our framers and founding fathers? That is the difference between nation builders and political brokers. They know what is needed to set the foundation for the evolution to progress and to be better. Equality and meritocracy for all to pursue their best. They brought that leadership. Notice something, none of them started out in politics. These leaders all came from the accomplished private sector careers to do national service. Now let us go south, that tiny red dot below our navel, Singapore. Lee Kuan Yew may have co-founded the Pupil Action Party in 1954, but readings of his early career shows his time working during the Japanese occupation. A first-class honor law graduate student in the in the UK and practiced law in Singapore. As the founder of modern Singapore, what did he ensure? Let me list what I believe is the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew's leadership that made Singapore a success. A secular nationhood. English as the lingua franca of education and governance in spite of a majority population being Chinese. Meritocracy is the standard not race, not religion. Integrity as the hallmark of its governance. To very different societies with very different histories and timelines. Both with multi-ethnic and multi-religious populations. Yet, those four aspects I mentioned are exactly the four that built the United States. When the US had slavery in its U.S. had slavery in its borders, then still it, is, it already proclaimed that all men are created equal. Their founding fathers had laid that foundation for equality at the very base. And to digress a bit, they were even smart enough to come up with what is known as the Three-Fifths Compromise, a compromise agreement between delegates from the northern and the southern states at the United States Constitutional Convention in 1787, that three-fifths of the slave population would be counted for determining direct taxation and representation in the House of Representatives. Why? Otherwise, the slave states would overwhelm the Federation. What I want to show is the kind of leadership nation building requires, and thus we will get the results we desire. They don't ask what is it that the masses want, that we must follow. Instead, they ask what society do we want for the masses to develop into. And then they constructed a foundation towards that. Look around. Is that what our politicians are over the last 60 years? We need change. There are no magic bullet or shortcut to change. It is like anything else in life. Hard work and perseverance to reach our goal, no matter how impossible it looks. We need to bring that attitude in our efforts to make change. Put our money and effort where our mouths are. Even if we start with one or two MPs of the caliber needed, that is the change we have to make. What the history I just painted shows you that it is not youth, male or female, or other superfluous characteristics that brought out a leader that will spark change or lead movements to change. Notice the pattern. Number one, they are all established persons in their own right before they embark on politics. They learned how to live and make a mark in life first. That means they were toiling for years making a living, learning and making something of themselves in the marketplace or what we call today the private sector. Number two, they are circular in their outlook and equality and integrity are their greatest values. Lastly, they believe in merit. Number three, 
they have either strong legal minds or critical thinking that allows them to do so. I will stop at that, but here is something most people I talk to fail to realize. It is our jobs as citizens to find and bring these people into the chambers of government, in our case, the parliament. Leaders like these do not come begging for power. They are reluctant politicians. They don't even see themselves as politicians, but civil servants when they are chosen. We must find ways to put them there. And then their leadership will come forth. You will see how they conduct themselves, catalyzing change in parliament and permeating that out to the public. One by one, election by elections, these kind of people will bring change, not political parties, but individual MPs. There are those who say, I am not pragmatic, or it's too slow. But what real choice do we have? Do the same and get the same results? Have we not learned enough over the last 40 years and these last three years to know that we have a broken system that need to be revolutionized, even if with one or too small pebble to make the ripple of change grow. Thank you very much.